All right. Um, so we're going to start with a little bit of math. And so just real quickly, whenever we do any calculations for AP Chem, we'll have to make sure there's a unit or a measurement after our number. So you're never going to write like just if your answer to a problem is nine, you're never just going to write nine. You're always going to have something behind it. Is it nine grams? nine moles, nine seconds. You've always got to make sure you have the correct unit of measurement, okay? That's kind of pretty much what all this stuff is. You guys have probably seen all this before, mass, length, time. Um, you don't need to memorize these. I'd say the ones that we use the most are these and then the moles at the very bottom. Um, and I'm sure, and as we go through the year and the problems, you'll get more and more familiar with them. So don't feel like you need to memorize all of these, okay? All right, uh, let's move on to scientific notation. So hopefully you guys have seen this in your previous either math classes or in your chemistry classes. Uh, but scientific measurement is just a way for us to measure very big or very small numbers without um, it making it look very ugly. And so I'm not really going to spend a lot of time going over how to do scientific notation. They talk about it in your textbook. And um, if you ever need help with it, please let me know. But I'm not going to spend too much class. All right. Sorry, I know I'm going through this really fast, but that's kind of what the pace will be like. Um, so um, a lot of people ask me about like, where do I stop writing the numbers when I get an answer? Um, the key, and I, you might want to jot this down just as a reminder. Um, there is a whole section in your textbook on scientific, no or not scientific notation, on significant figures. We're not going to do that because it takes a lot of time to memorize the rules. And honestly, it's kind of a waste of time, um, but you can get, a four, a five on the AP test, just by following this rule, just give three non-zero numbers after the decimal. Okay, that's I think it's a good general rule of thumb to remember. Um, if you write three non-zero numbers after the decimal, you will be fine with your calculations and they're not gonna mark it wrong, okay? So I got some examples here. If it's 16.25011, it's right, 16.25, or you can even drop the zero if you want. If you got 3.14159286, you can just write 3.142, okay? Rounding the last number, that's totally up to you. You can round it if you want to, but you don't have to. That's fine. So there will be some leeway um, in your calculation. So you don't need to match the exact number that I get. So when we're doing practice problems later, you might see this. But if I put a number up on the board, yours doesn't have to be exact. As long as it's pretty close, then you should be fine. And always you can confirm with me. All right, let's uh, go into the action. Let's go into some practice problems. So we're gonna get started with um, some dimensional analysis. Hopefully this isn't too new to you guys, but dimensional analysis is basically a way to turn one unit of measurement into another unit of measurement. And I'm gonna show you guys how to do that right now. Um, let's do question 1.1, just as a quick warm up. Um, but whenever you do any math problem, first thing you want to do is take a look at what the problem is asking you to find. So what unit of measurement is it asking you to find? So if you take a look at this problem, 1.1, what's the unit of measurement that you want to find? Centimeter. Yeah, centimeters. It says convert to centimeters. So your final answer should be in centimeters. Okay. <clears throat> and I know here, Sounds kind of like, okay, duh. But once you go into a more difficult problems, um, this will be very helpful to figure out like, hey, what am I trying to find at the very end of the problem? Okay, so we're gonna take 54.5 meters into centimeters. So I'm just gonna write down the starting number, the given number, 54.15 meters. And what we wanna do is we want to turn this into centimeters. And we do that through dimensional analysis. So what you wanna do is you basically just set up a fraction next to our starting number. And if you guys remember in algebra, if I wanna cancel something out, uh, then you wanna put the exact same variable, the same unit of measurement on the bottom. So here we have this conversion factor, one meter is a hundred centimeters. So we got meters right here, but it's asking us to turn into centimeters, right? So we, we're gonna put one meter on the bottom and the reason why we do that is so that the meters can cancel out with each other. And then the top has to equal the bottom. So one meter is equal to 100 centimeters. So there you go. 
we set it up like this so the meters can cancel out. And if you notice, the only measurement is centimeters. What's up? Uh, will, will we be the points if we could say 54.5 not centimeters? Or do we have to get to the Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah
And on the bottom, we got a thousand. So we're going to divide by 1000. So you'll get an answer of 54.72 kilometers per hour. Oops. And that's going to be our final answer. Any questions on that one? Yes. Yeah, but show your work. Yeah. Just letting you know, it's not going to be this easy. But yeah, if we had a problem like this, that'd be totally fine. Okay, let's do one more, 1.3 together. Um, If you... Are confident in your ability to do it, you can just kind of zone me out and just try it out, but I'm going to go over it just in case. This one has scientific notation. Um, that's why I kind of wanted to go over it real quick. So it tells you the lung capacity of a blue whale is five times 10 to the three liters. Now, whenever you see this right here, we talked about how this is scientific notation. And an easy way to just convert scientific notation is just kind of look at this exponent right here. Okay, the exponent is three. Now, the question you always want to ask yourself is, is it positive three or negative three? Because that tells you how to change the number. So this right here, is it positive or negative? Yeah, it's positive three. So what we want to do is, since it's positive, you just take the decimal point, right? Five is the same thing as 5.0. And if you have a positive exponent, you want to move the decimal point to the right, okay? However many spaces for the number. So it's positive three. So you're gonna move the decimal one, two, three times to the right and just fill it in with zeros. If the exponent is negative, just go the opposite way, you go left. Okay, so that's an easy way to do scientific notation. Scientific notation is just a fancy way of telling you where to move the decimal. That's pretty much it. If this is a review for you and this is boring, I apologize, but I promise it'll get harder later, okay? I respect you guys too much to keep it this easy. Okay, so it's 5,000 liters. And then from here, super easy, right? It's exactly what we've been doing. We just set up a fraction. You wanna get rid of liters. So we're gonna put liters on the bottom. So 3.785 liters. Gonna turn it into gallons. So we put one gallon on the top. And now I'll give you guys a minute to punch this into your calculator, um, see what you guys get. And that'll be the last uh, dimensional analysis problem we do for now. We're gonna skip 1.4. So see if you can uh, solve 1.3 and then we'll move on to the next section. Alrighty guys, so hopefully you did 5,000 divided by 3.785. And then that's going to give you an answer of 1321 uh, gallons. Any questions? All right. So that's dimensional analysis. Um, I promise it'll get harder. Um, we'll be working with different formulas and more complex units of measurement. But that's kind of the general gist of dimensional analysis. Okay. Anybody need another minute to copy it down? I feel like every second I talk, I'm just sucking more and more life out of your guys' eyes. You guys seemed so energetic yesterday. Oh, okay. That's good. I appreciate that. I'm not, though. I'm by far the worst science teacher here by far. Okay. I'm also the shortest, which doesn't help. But anyway, okay. Next is uh, derived SI units. So derived SI units, we've already looked at this. Um, it's the same thing that we've been talking about where you have units of measurement that are in a fraction, right? So meters per second, you can have volume. And this is one that's a little bit, uh, I wanna highlight this one. Make sure you guys write this down. Um, volume is how much space something takes up. So if you guys remember from geometry class, uh, you guys got your three dimensional shapes, right? And so 
A very common unit of measurement we use for volume is milliliters. Now, milliliters is the same thing as centimeters cubed. Yeah, I just want you guys to keep that in mind because it's centimeters times centimeters times centimeters. Okay, this is actually going to come into play on one of your the problems we have here. There's one on your homework that's going to involve this. And on your test, you'll have a problem where you'll need to remember that. Okay, one milliliter is centimeters cubed. Well, we'll get back to that later. All right, so that's an important one for volume. Volume is a derived unit because it's made up of multiple units multi multiplied together. And then the other one that we'll be focusing on is density, okay? Density, the formula is mass divided by volume. An easy way to remember it is D is equal to, it's a heart, right? And then there's an arrow going through it. Mass times volume or mass divided by volume. And if you have somebody that you like, you can write your name in there. And I'm gonna write my, my name and my wife's name, okay? But density is mass divided by volume. It's just a heart. So mass, typically we measure it in grams and then we divide it by milliliters volume. So those are the two that I wanna highlight. Um, because we will be talking about density quite a bit. And density is just kind of a way, it's a way of describing how much stuff is in an amount of space. Okay, so if you think about something that's dense, there's a lot of stuff confined into a, into a space. Okay. So with that being said, let's go on to 1.5. So I kind of want to challenge you guys a little bit. Um, this isn't this isn't a super easy problem, but I want to give you guys about three minutes. I want you guys to work with the person next to you. See if you guys can solve 1.5 or at least get some um, get some ideas rolling about it. One quick thing I do want to one tip I do want to give you is whenever you're solving a problem in AP Chem, always look at the numbers and see how the numbers correlate to each other. And how can you use these numbers in order to solve for whatever the question is asking for? So for here, it's asking, what is the pellet's density? Okay, we talked about how density is mass over volume. So it's going to be probably like grams divided by milliliters or something like that. Okay, so that's my little hint to you guys. I'll give you about three minutes to work on that, and then we'll go over it together. All right, so for this problem, um, I'm going to draw a picture. Um, I'm very bad at drawing, but I'm a visual person. And so I'll do my best. You guys don't need to copy the picture down because I've been told my drawings are pretty dog, but anyway. Um, so it tells you that you're doing a density demonstration and then the student has a small metal pellet. So there's a graduated cylinder. Okay. So the size of the graduated cylinder is a hundred milliliters. And then the student fills it to 50 milliliters. So the original water level is 50 milliliters. Okay. Okay. The student's going to drop the pellet in. So boop, the pellet goes in. And then once the pellet goes in, the water level is going to rise to 51.3 milliliters. Okay. So it's going to start initially at 50 milliliters. And then it's going to end up at 51.3 milliliters. So far, so good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah tells us that the mass of the pellet, so this pellet right here, the mass is 8.74 grams. And the question is asking, what is the density? All right, so we have our setup right here. We looked at all of the numbers. And so let's try to figure out if we can get density out of this. So it tells us right here to look for density. And we learned that density is mass divided by volume. Okay, so let's see if we can plug in some of the things in here to find density. Okay, so let's look at M. Do we have a value for M? Yeah, what's the value for M that we have? Exactly, 8.74 grams. So we're gonna write 8.74 grams on the top of the fraction, and then we're gonna divide by the volume. Now, volume is where it might get a little tricky because there's two different volumes, right? But what we're looking for is not the volume of the cylinder or the water. We're looking for the volume of the pellet, right? So if the pellet raised the water level, how would we find the volume of just the pellet? Yeah, subtract or the difference, right? So 
51.3 minus 50. So that means the volume of the pellet is 1.3 milliliters. So if you got this set up, great job. Okay. If you don't like word problems, I'm sorry. It's just a lot of word problems. And so you'll have to visualize a lot and your teacher is a bad drawer. So yeah, sorry. Okay. So now we got density. We can just plug this into our calculator and then we'll be all done. So we got 8.74 on the top divided by 1.3. And so the density of the pellet is going to be 6.723. And then the unit of measurement is grams per milliliter. That's it. That's how you solve that problem. Okay. Any questions on that? So when in doubt, try to use the formulas that you have, like the density formula, and see if you can turn the, use the numbers in order to figure out um, the unit of measurement you're looking for. Okay. All right, so um, I'll leave that up there for a second, but we're gonna work on 1.6 together. Um, now, before we work on 1.6, I do want to give you a quick formula um, to use. So in chemistry, we use a lot of percentages. And so if you guys are unfamiliar with how to find percentage, this is a quick formula that you can use um, in order to find percent. Okay. So whatever you're looking for in a percentage, you put on the top. You're going to divide that by a total of whatever you're looking at. And then you multiply that by 100%. That's how you can find the percentage of something. That's the percentage formula. And so with that being said, I'll give you guys about three minutes to work on 1.6 together. I do want to give you one conversion factor though. Um, and it's that one gram is equal to 1000 milligrams. Okay. So those will be the two things I leave you with. I'll give you guys about three minutes to try that out. And then we will go over together. All right, so in this problem, it tells you that you got an aspirin tablet. So I'll draw my tablet right here. And the entire tablet has a mass of three grams, okay? Also tells us that it contains 325 milligrams of acetyl salicylic acid. So that's the active ingredient in there. So I'll do that with the pink. So the pink stuff, is going to be 325 milligrams, okay? And it's asking, what's the percent by mass of the pink stuff? I don't wanna say that word again, okay? So we're looking for the pink stuff, right? And so that's what we wanna put on the top of the fraction for the percentage, okay? Now, before we plug anything in, let's take a look at these two numbers. Anyone notice something that we should take care of first? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. You want to make sure that you have the same units of measurement before you plug it into a formula. That way it doesn't jack up your numbers. Okay. So if we take a look here, um, I am going to turn milligrams into grams, but if you did it the other way, that's totally fine. Uh, milligrams, this is the same thing as 0 0.325 grams. Um, but again, if you wanted to do the other way for grams and you did this as 3000 milligrams, that's totally fine too. Okay. So we're gonna plug it into our percentage formula right here. We're looking for the pink stuff. So we're gonna put the pink stuff on top. So 0 0.325 grams, okay? Divided by, okay, the total mass, which is three grams. And then we're just going to multiply it by 100%. Okay, and the reason why, again, we want to convert it is so that the grams can cancel each other out. And then we got a nice little formula um, to work with. So on the top, 0.325 divided by 3 times 100. And so you'll get a final answer of 10.833%. That's it. It's easy. So whatever you're looking for in the percentage, that goes on the top of the fraction. The total goes on the bottom times 100. Yeah, what's up? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, of course. I'll uh, put it up here. So let me just, so this is grams. So same thing for milligrams. Um, on the top, 
you're going to put 325 milligrams divided by the 3,000 milligrams, so 3,000 milligrams, and then times 100%. And so if we want to test that out on the calculator, it'll just be 325 divided by 3,000 times 100, and you'll get the same answer. All right, guys, so we're actually going to take a five-minute break um, before we go on to 1.7. Um, 1.7 is a question that's on your homework. Um, I forgot which one. I'll tell you guys the number in a second. So we'll do one of your homework problems in class just to kind of help you out. So during the five minutes, you can run to the restroom, take a stretch break, walk around, get some water. Um, but in five minutes, we'll uh, get started on 1.7, okay? So I'm not going to read the problem. Oh, no. We're offline. Okay. I'm not going to read the problem, but if you take a look at it, we can get some good information out of this. Um, the first thing you should see right away is that the density of this material that we're looking at is 0 0.2 grams per centimeters cubed. Okay. And the other thing that we should see is that the surface area is going to be 1242 meters squared and that's going to be per gram okay Twelve forty-two meters squared per gram per always means divided by one of whatever the unit is okay that's why miles per hour is miles in one hour okay so with those two things let's work on part a it's asking us to calculate the volume so we're looking for volume of 10 milligrams of this material. So let's pause right there. If we see volume, what's the unit of measurement that we should end up with at the end of the problem? Sorry. Yeah, cubic meters, centimeters cubed, something cubed, right? Milliliters maybe. Um, but we're gonna have, let's, let's say centimeters cubed for now because that's kind of what we have for volume right here. But yeah, something cubed. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna work with this number right here, the 10 milligrams, and see if we can use one of these in order to turn this into centimeters cubed, okay? So between the two, density and surface area, which is the one that you think we're gonna have to use? Which one has volume inside of it? Density. Yeah, density, right? Centimeters cubed on the bottom, we learned that it's mass divided by volume. So we're gonna be working probably with this one right here. Okay, the problem is though, the density we have is grams per centimeters cubed, right? But we have it in milligrams. So we have to turn this into grams first. So the first thing that we wanna do in this problem is we wanna turn milligrams into grams. So milligrams on the bottom, grams on the top. And earlier, I think I gave you guys the conversion factor. It's, oops, wrong way. Yeah, one gram, God bless you is 1,000 milligrams. And so if we do that, milligrams cancel, and we got grams on top, which is what we want, because that's density. Okay. So far, so good? Now, we're not done because we have grams left, but we want to turn it into volume, so we're going to set up a fraction. So if I want to get rid of grams, where should I put it on this fraction? Bottom. So we want to put grams on the bottom and then centimeters cubed on the top. Okay, so we see that density is 0 0.2 grams per one centimeters cubed. So we'll put one on the top, 0 0.2 grams on the bottom. And that's coming from here. Oops. This fraction is right here. All we're doing is just kind of flipping it. And the reason we do that is because the grams will cancel out. Now, all we have left is centimeters cubed. And so we just plug this into the calculator and that's it, that's your answer. So if you guys notice, all we're doing is just kind of manipulating the fractions, flipping it back and forth in order to get the unit of measurement we want. Okay, so plug it into your calculator, see what you guys get.
Yeah. Five. Double check the uh how you input it. It has a five in it though. All right, so if we plug it into the calculator, our starting number is 10, uh, and then we're gonna divide that by 1,000, and then we're gonna divide that by 0 0.2, and so your final answer will be 0 0.05. Okay. And since our unit of measurement is centimeters cubed, that's it. That's gonna be our final answer. Yes? No, not at all. We'll need it for the next part, but um, you're not going to need all the numbers for every part. That's another annoying part about the AP Chem test. You got to filter out the info for each part. And sometimes there's info you don't even need, which is annoying. All right, any questions on part A? Yes. Where I, where I put the numbers on the fraction? Or, okay, yeah. So we put 10 milligrams because that's our starting number, right? That's where we get the 10 milligrams. We set up this fraction right here um, in order to turn milligrams into grams. Okay, so that's why um, earlier we I gave you the conversion one gram is 1,000 milligrams. And that's where we got this first fraction. We put 1,000 on the bottom so the milligrams can cancel. And then one gram on the top. And then in order to turn it into volume, because volume is centimeters cubed, we use the density formula right, or the density right here. It's 0.2 grams goes on the bottom to cancel out with the grams here. And then centimeters cubed on top, because that's what we're looking for. Any other questions? All right, let's uh, go to part B. Um, so. Part B is very, very similar to part A, except this time, instead of working with density, it's saying surface area. Okay, so since we're looking for surface area, probably gonna need this, right? So um, let's uh, get into it. So our starting number again is going to be 10 milligrams. And then if you look at our surface area, it's meters squared divided by grams, right? So since it's grams, we're obviously going to need to convert this into grams. All righty. So um, on the bottom, since we want to get rid of milligrams, I'm going to use this conversion factor because it's written here but you can use this one if you like, you'll get the same number. You're gonna have one milligram on the bottom. That way the milligrams can cancel. And that's going to be equal to 0 0.001 grams. Okay. All right, we got to turn it into surface area now. So we're gonna set up one more fraction. And since we're using surface area, we're gonna use this value right here. It's actually easier because we don't need to flip it. We can just put it exactly the way it is. It's going to be 1242 meters squared per one gram. And then the grams will cancel out. There you go. All you have left is the surface area. So pretty much the same problem as before. Um, it's You're converting from milligrams to grams and then turning it into surface area using the value that we're given. So if we punch it into our calculator, it's 10 times 0 0.001 times 1242. You get a final answer of 12.42. And then meters squared. Yes. Hmm? No, no, I'm talking to Diego. Yeah, you're good. 
my bad. <laughs> that was really confusing for you. I'm just throwing up gang signs at you. <laughs> Alrighty, um, I'll give you guys about three minutes to work on part C. Um, part C is not the same as part A and B, so just a heads up about that. Um, you will need the percentage formula, so hope make sure you have that written down. I'll write it up in a second, uh, but I'll give you three minutes to work on part C. And then if you got time, you can do part D as well. Um, you'll need C to do D. So take about three minutes to work on that, and then we'll go over it. All right, so in this problem, it's a lot of numbers. Some of it unnecessary. Um, so it's kind of kind of need to filter out the unnecessary stuff, but I'm gonna do a picture again. Um yeah, so you got a 10 milliliter sample of contaminated water. So let's say this is our sample. Okay, it says it's 10 milliliters. Okay, and it contains 7.748 milligrams of mercury. So I'll use pink for that. Okay, so there's this contaminated mercury in there. There's 7.748 milligrams. Okay, so it's treated with some kind of spongy material. So I'm gonna do it in black right here. So this is sponge. This thing is 10 milligrams. Okay, so a lot of numbers. Okay, and then so it says that after the treatment, okay, so this is gonna be at the start. So after the treatment, there's only going to be 0 0.001 milligrams left. Okay, and then it's asking what percentage of the mercury was removed from the water. Okay, so I know this can be again a little confusing because there's a lot of numbers in here. Um, be honest with you guys, like half of it's unnecessary, and so you guys got to filter that out. So it's asking us to first figure out, um, or first thing we need to figure out is okay, what percentage are we looking for? Are we looking for the percentage of the water? No, so this is probably not going to be important. Are we looking for the percentage of the spongy material? No, so we don't need that. So the only thing we really need is the numbers for the mercury. Okay, so earlier we said that the formula for percentage is whatever you're looking for, okay, divided by the total times 100%. Okay, so let's figure out what the what we're looking for in this problem. Okay, so... We are looking for the mercury that was removed from the water, okay? So we started off with 7.748, right? That means that's gonna be our total. So the total mercury that we're working with here on the bottom is going to be 7.748, okay? Does that make sense? All right. What we're looking for is the mercury that's removed from the water. So I know some of you guys might be tempted. Oh, the other number we have is 0.001. I'm going to plug that in. Unfortunately, that's not correct because 0.001 milligrams, it's not what was removed, right? It's what's left over. It's still in there. So we're not looking for what's still in the water. We're looking for the mercury that was removed. And so what we have to do is we need to subtract the two. And that's how we can find what was removed because this is what's left. Okay, so on the very top, we're going to be putting 7.747 milligrams. Okay, so that was kind of the trick there. So if I tricked you, I apologize, but I'm going to be doing that a lot this year. All right, so from there, super simple. You just plug and chug into the calculator. So 7.747 divided by 7.748 times 100, and you get your final answer. You can round that if you want. It's gonna be 99.987%. You put 99%, basically most of it. All right, All right. any questions on that? Hopefully, even if you Switch up the numbers that that kind of clarify things. Just be very careful when you're reading the problem. Yeah. Yes. But I mean, again, you guys had the like first day of chemistry. We have like a, I don't know, like a hundred, like a hundred more class sessions to go. So yeah, it will get harder, but um, I think you guys will be fine. Yeah. And if you fail, it's okay, guys. You take it again in college. All right. 
So from here, this is this part, part D is very easy. Um, it's asking you for the final mass of the spongy material um, after exposure to mercury. So what was the starting mass of the spongy material? Yeah, 10 milligrams. Okay, if it absorbs the mercury, right, we're gonna add however much mercury it, it absorbed. So the calculation we just did. Okay, and so you should just add it together. 17.747 milligrams. That's it. Easy peasy. All right, so I'll pause right there. Any questions on any of the stuff that we've covered so far? I know that it's a lot of information. I'm just kind of like, you know, word vomiting at you guys a lot of things, but um, yeah, hopefully not too bad. Okay, so from there, we'll move on to the next section. Or oh, actually, I should ask, anyone still copying this down? And if you ever miss anything, please don't freak out. I record all these lectures, it's recording right now, and I'll post, I'll post them on Canvas right after class. Um, so you'll always have these handy. If you're ever absent, you'll have all the lectures available. Okay. All right, let's move on to the next part. Next part is fun part, intro to matter. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about atoms and molecules now. So if you've taken, who's taken chemistry already? I think you guys all should have. Everyone take chemistry? Anyone not take chemistry yet? Okay, cool, easy. All right, so we're gonna be talking about atoms and molecules. So hopefully this is review. Um, atoms are the individual blocks. It's like one Lego block. Molecules are when you put the Lego blocks together and you make a Lego structure, okay? So here we have some visual things. So we got simple stuff like oxygen made out of two oxygen atoms, right? Water made out of one oxygen, two hydrogens, et cetera, et cetera. And it gets super complex from there. All right, so we're gonna be talking about the periodic table. If this is reviewed for you, again, I'm sorry, please bear with me, um, but just wanna go over a couple of things. So if you guys remember or forgot, the number on the top is called the atomic number. And this tells you how many protons there are, okay? The number on the top of every box tells you how many protons there are. The letter in the middle is going to be the chemical symbol. It basically tells you what element you're looking at. And then the number on the bottom right here is the molar mass. We'll talk about that again in the next unit more in depth. Um, but that's kind of just a general info of the periodic table, okay? each individual block. Okay. One other thing about the periodic table, um, I'm not going to be quizzing you on vocab or anything, um, but just so that when you're doing your reading, you can remember. Um, the rows, that is not a good line. The rows, okay, the, when you go side to side, these are called periods. Okay. And then the columns going up and down on the periodic table, those are called groups. Okay, so again, I'm never gonna quiz you on that, um, but just keep that in mind as you guys are reading your text, they'll say in the same period. And then you gotta know that it goes side to side or in the same group, just know that it goes up and down, All right? Okay, let's talk very briefly about the different types of elements. There are three types of elements on the periodic table. You do not need to memorize this like exactly. You just need to know generally where everything is. Um, just know that generally most of the periodic table are metals. It's like the left, the middle, and the bottom. Okay. Uh, metalloids make up this weird little staircase feature. Again, you don't even need to memorize this. Just know it starts from boron and it kind of just goes down from there diagonally. And then the nonmetals are on the right side. Um, the only exception, and this is, I guess, the only thing you need to memorize, is that hydrogen is a nonmetal. Okay, that's the only exception to the rule, okay? So metals are on the left, the middle, and the bottom. Metalloids are, I don't know how to describe that. It's like diagonal, right, somewhere. I think I spelled diagonal wrong. Okay, and then nonmetals are on the right, and then the only exception is hydrogen. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Again, not going to be quizzing you. I'm not going to be like, hey, is carbon, what type of element is carbon? Or what type of element is platinum? Okay, it's just generally so that we know where they go. Okay. Okay. Any questions about that? 
All righty. Let's go back to my favorite thing. Let's go back to some more math. All right. So law of constant competition. Um, this kind of has to do more with like percentages and ratios. So we're going to be looking at this. Um, but the law of constant composition basically means that when you have a molecule, no matter how much of that molecule you have, the composition, so like the ratio of each element in there will always be the same. So one good example is water. Everyone here should be familiar that water is H2O, right? How many hydrogens are inside water? Two. How many oxygens are there? One. Okay, so no matter how much water you have, whether you have one cup, one gallon, you got the whole ocean, the entire, the ratio will always be two hydrogens for every one oxygen, okay? That's the law of constant composition. Just basically telling you the ratio will always be the same for that chemical. Okay, so let's take a look at 1.8. Okay, 1.8 tells you that a compound contains 50 grams of FeO. You guys don't need to write this down. I don't even know why that's there. Okay, it tells you that a compound is 50 grams of iron and a compound is 100 grams of oxygen. Okay, and this is talking about the same chemical. So we'll call this, uh, I don't know, vibranium. Okay, we'll say vibranium is 50 grams of iron and 100 grams of oxygen. Okay. All right, you got another piece of vibranium. Okay. And then it's telling you that the other piece contains seven grams of iron. And then what we're looking for is how many grams of oxygen it has. So this is our original. And this is the one that we want to figure out some more information about. Does that scenario make sense? Okay. So if we take a look at the original, since we have both parts, we can figure out the ratio. What's the ratio between the two? Yeah, it's either one to two or 50 to 100, whatever, right? It's the same thing. We just know that it's fifth. you have double the amount of oxygen as you have of iron, right? So if... Let's say again, this compound right here, if you have double the oxygen of iron, if you have another piece of that compound, if you have seven grams of iron, how much oxygen do you have? Yeah, 14, just double it. That's it. Super easy. It's just ratios. If you wanted to be more fancy about it and do it with math, um, you could set up a fraction if you'd like. So let's say that we didn't know it's 14. Um, we can just set up a fraction. So 50 divided by 100 is equal to 7 divided by, let's call it O, because we're looking for oxygen. Okay. You can just solve for this. So let's just say X, sorry. And then from there, it's just regular algebra. You're solving for X. You cross multiply and you solve for X. You should get 14. All right. Any questions about that? Yeah. If you had to show our work in the same way, you do it or just you can do it differently. As long as the number your answer is the same, you did it fine. Yeah. I know there's different ways to do it, so I'm cool with it. Okay. So we'll go into I think this is the second to let me get out. Second to last uh problem for this uh unit for the lecture. Um it's another percentage problem. So I'm gonna have you guys try 1.9 on your own. I'll give you guys about three minutes to do that. And then we'll get into the last section and we'll actually be done with this unit. We'll have an extra day to just kind of prep for the test uh, next time. Okay, okay so um, same thing here as before. It's another percentage problem. So it's asking us to find the mass percent of both elements inside of the compound. Um, so the first thing we want to do is figure out what the total mass is. So to find the total mass, we just need to add these up, right? So the total mass is going to be 260. So let's do uh, copper first, and then we'll do sulfur. Um, so for copper, what we're going to do is we're going to take the mass of copper, so 70 grams. We're going to divide it by the total, which is 260. Multiply it by 100%, and that will give you 
the mass percentage of copper. Any questions on that setup? Oh, you give me the answer? Yeah. 26.92? Thank you. Save me the trouble. Appreciate it. Is he right? Yeah. Okay. All right. And then the other one, so you can do this two ways. You can do it, I guess, the harder way, which is just do the same thing. 190 grams, 260 grams times 100%. And that'll give you 73.08. Okay. Yeah, still got it. It's the Asian genetics. Okay. So you can do it that way. Or if you notice, there's only two things in there, right? So if you got the percentage of one of them, right? All you got to do is do 100% minus 26.92%. And you could have gotten it like that. So either way works. If you did it either way, that's totally fine. Okay, that's it. So just make sure, so I guess the moral of the story for this unit is just make sure you're very comfortable finding percentages. Uh, make sure you're comfortable working with dimensional analysis. Those are the two big skills that um, I would really recommend. And next time we meet, we will spend about half the class reviewing for the test. And we're actually gonna spend the second half of the class starting the next unit. Um, and so just a heads up about that, okay? Okay, but your test is still on next Friday, so don't worry. I'm not going to push up your test. All right, let's go to the last section. This is it. This is this one's real quick. I'm just going to give you guys some information, and then you guys can actually, we'll actually go over the answer next time. Okay, but we're going to be talking about something called alloys. Now, alloys are metallic solids um, where you mix two metals together. That's what an alloy is. So for example, um, something that you guys might be familiar with is steel. Okay. Steel is an alloy. It's made out of iron and carbon. Okay. So there are two different types of alloys. I wouldn't get too like, I don't know. Don't spend too much time studying this for the test. It's not going to be that important. It'll be a there's a problem on alloys, but that's not going to be where most of the points come from. Okay. So don't spend majority of your time on this. Um, but there are two types of alloys, uh, interstitial alloys and substitutional alloys. Okay. Interstitial just basically means that the alloys, the elements are different sizes. The two things that make up the alloys, they're different sizes. Okay. Interstitial, the only thing that's really important is that it makes, it makes the alloy more rigid and it decreases malleability and ductility, okay? So that's the important part for interstitial. Okay, substitutional alloys are where the two uh, elements, they're about the same size, um, and so it's kind of the opposite. The alloy is malleable and ductile, okay? But the key thing to remember is this right here. Okay, two and three are kind of important, so you can you can skim that on your own time. Um, but the purpose of an alloy is to make the metal stronger. Okay, so every alloy is going to be stronger than the original things that make it up. So steel is stronger than iron and stronger than carbon, because okay? that's the two things that make it. That's pretty much it about alloys. I told you it'd be fast. Okay, so again, just a heads up. When you do your reading, make sure you spend most of your time not just reading the textbook. Um, I'll let you guys know you'll fail the test if all you do is read the textbook. Um, do the practice problems on the back of the book. I would say even go back to this workbook, see if you can solve the problems on your own um, because that is the best way to study for the exam. Okay. And then doing the homework will help. All right, so we'll end right there.